everyone, welcome back. This is the video for chapter 11 in our book. So chapter 11 is all about radio navigation, the frequency flyer program. Okay, so how does that work? Well, when we talk about radio navigation, we're primarily talking about VORs. Yes, also somewhat a little bit GPS, but um, you know that's kind of the thrust of this chapter is talking about VORs, VHF omnidirectional ranging. That's what VOR stands for. Now a lot of people get confused with how VORs work, and you know what you can do with them. So I want to give you what I think is a pretty simple analogy that kind of describes how a VOR works. It's not exactly how this works, but it's pretty close. So I want to say, imagine if you will, a lighthouse. So we have a lighthouse and it has a little beacon. Now it's a not traditional lighthouse. It has a one-sided beacon. It doesn't have two sides. So this beacon turns at one RPM, one revolution per minute, or 60 seconds per revolution. Now, on this strange lighthouse, we also have a beacon on the top. It's omnidirectional. It's a red flashy beacon. And the beacon flashes when the beam is pointed north. That's when this is going to flash. So using this strange lighthouse that I just described, can you tell where you are relative to the lighthouse? Yes, you can. And here's how this works. Let's assume that as you view it from the top, this thing turns clockwise. If I see the beam at the exact same time I see the flash, I'm north. If I see the beam 15 seconds after the flash, I'm east. If I see it 30 seconds, I'm south. And if I see the beam 45 seconds, after the flash, then I must be to the west. So it would be pretty easy, as long as you could see both of these, to have a navigation system like this. Like, I see the beacon, boom, flash, start my timer. Oh, it was seven and a half seconds, I'm northeast, I'm on a heading of 45 degrees. So that is kind of how a VOR works. The only difference is that the VOR use, does this electronically. So it sends out an omnidirectional signal, if you will. That's the little red beacon on top. And then it sends out this rotating signal. Now you might say, how does it do that? It doesn't physically rotate something in there. It electronically sends out a signal that rotates and how it's going to be transmitted. So what happens is your radio will take those two signals and it says, what's the phase difference? If they're 180 degrees out of phase, you're to the south. If you're 90 degrees out, 
you're east, and if you're 90 degrees the other way, you're west. Right? So that is essentially how a VOR radio works. It compares these two signals. It looks at a phase shift. And I know some of you really love math, so I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to go and you know draw sine waves and show you how this actually works mathematically. So that is essentially the way the thing works internally. Now, what's a, a VOR good for? A VOR, and Rod, of course, has a nice picture of what a station looks like. You don't have to fly very far. There's one up in Milton. There's one over in Sealand Scrub. There's also one in Hazleton that's been decommissioned. But what is the purpose of a VOR? What can it do for me? So, VOR question. What is the question that it answers? What is the ultimate question to life, the universe, and everything? Okay, it's not that question. But the question that a VOR answers is this. Where am I relative to the station? Now, why am I talking about this? Why am I giving you this question? There's a very simple reason why I'm giving you this question. Do you see anywhere in here anything that has to do with which way I'm facing? You don't. Right? If the station is to my north and I'm facing to the west, I'm still in the same place. If I'm facing to the south, I'm still in the same place. Why am I making a big deal about this? A lot of pilots get confused because they'll say, oh, I look at the needle. And what's the needle say? The needle says go this way, or the needle says go that way. And then they're not really sure what to do. So keep this in mind. Where am I relative to the station? That is the big question that this instrument is intended to answer. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about VORs and using the CDI. Course deviation indicator. So what's the whole purpose of the CDI? The CDI allows you to select a course, and basically when you select that course, you say, hey, Mr. Radio, I am going to fly a particular direction. I'm going to fly on a particular beam or what we call a radial. So in this case, I've dialed in zero, and that means I am going to fly along this line in this direction. So I told the radio, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to fly along this line toward the north. Please give me deviations from this line. And it will do that with a little needle. Now, sometimes, sometimes these needles are like old school wipers. And if you have a fancy newer CDI, this thing will go straight up and down and goes left and right, which is a little bit easier to read. Either one works though. So on the CDI, I have a centered position and then I have these little dots. So each dot is 
two degrees of deviation. So this is an angular deviation. So what happens when I have an angular deviation? If I'm way out here, the angular deviation is less. Let's say I'm off course. And I'm flying off course. Here I am. And I keep flying off course the same amount. As I get closer and closer, my angle is going to get higher. So as I get closer and closer to the station, a VOR becomes more and more sensitive. So that's the first thing you need to understand about VORs. This is sometimes a good thing. If I'm flying an instrument approach, which I know you're not there yet, but I'm hopeful that most of you will go on and get an instrument rating someday. You'll learn a little bit more about how this works, right? So you're getting closer and closer and you're like, all right, I need to correct. Things like an ILS, an instrument landing system, work in a similar way where it gets more and more sensitive as you get closer. We consider that a good thing. It's a bad thing if I'm doing an instrument approach that's say 30 miles away from this VOR, then I don't have as much accuracy when I'm far, far away. Okay, so this is angular deviations. Two degrees per dot. Another part of the CDI, so we have the OBS, the omnibearing selector, and I say, I'm gonna pick the radial that I want. There is also an indicator in here that's gonna it's gonna vary from aircraft to aircraft. Some of them have a little triangle that points upward, and a triangle that points downward. Upward is two. I'm going toward the station, and the downward one is from. Some of them actually have the words to and from. So whenever I say, hey, I want to go along this radial in this direction, it separates my space around the VOR into two half planes. So this is the two half plane, and this is the from half plane. Very important, remember that question we just talked about. Where am I relative to the station? So I'm answering that question. That has nothing to do with which way I'm pointing. So I could be flying off this way. And I can say, hey, it says two. I got a two indication over here. I'm good. No, you're not. You're not flying to the station. And why aren't you flying to the station? Because you lie to your radio. Your radio doesn't know what you're doing. It's just a stupid piece of electronics. So you told it, I'm going to fly toward the north on this line. And then you did something silly. You're flying toward the west away from the line. Of course, the deviation is going to go up and up and up and up as you get further and further off course. All right. So those are some more basics for VOR. What can I do with a VOR? One thing I can do with a VOR is I can fly a radial. I can also fly to it. And I can locate myself. Before everyone had GPS, 
this was a common thing that you could do, especially if you had two VORs. So we're going to talk about each of these individually. We're going to start with flying a radial. So how do I fly a particular radial? Step one, I tune the VOR in. Step two, I identify it. I look on my audio panel, I hit nav one, nav two, turn up the volume, and I listen for the Morse code. And I make sure that it's the correct VOR, and I also make sure that it's even running at all. If I don't hear anything, maybe it's down. It's kind of bad if you try to follow a VOR that's down. Some fancy radios, by the way, will automatically do this for you. It'll display the actual identifier. It decodes the Morse code automatically, which is kind of cool. All right, then I have to select the radio on my CDI. So, just to make it a little bit more interesting, I'm going to say I want to go to the east. That's going to be my radial. So here's my CDI. So what have I done? Here's my station. And I've told it I would like to fly along this line in this direction. So I select my radial and then I fly this direction. In my case, east. And turn to the east. Now what? Now, to make it easy, <clears throat> we'll say I was kind of close to being on this line. Right? If I'm not here, I need to do an intercept. Right? Okay, so let's just say I was over here. I turn toward the east. And now what's it going to tell me? It's going to tell me you're off course and you need to go to the right if I'm facing east. Again, Make sure, don't lie to it, don't tell it the wrong direction. A very common mistake people make is they put in west instead of east, and then they get what they call reverse sensing, where it's, when it says turn to the right, when it really means that you have to turn to the left. Why is it lying to me? Well, it's not lying to you, you lied to it. You said, I'm going this way, and you went totally opposite direction. So if I was over here, it's going to say, all right, you need to go to the right, and maybe you're off this much. So you're off two, four, five degrees. So you want to look at CDI. And then when you want to adjust your heading to intercept, now here's an important thing. This says turn to the right. Don't be this guy. I see this a lot. They start flying in a circle. 
Says turn right, says turn right, says turn right, says turn right. Well, remember, you told it you were basically flying east on this line. So how do you fix that? The maximum difference between your heading and what you dialed in here So the maximum distance between your heading and your OBS that you selected should be plus minus 30 degrees within 10 miles, plus minus 60 degrees within 20 miles. Well, well I should say more than. 10 nautical miles. Okay. How do I know if I'm close? Well, you should have a general idea where you are. There are ways of determining how far away you are by flying the perpendicular cores and timing things. And that involves math, which I know some of us don't really like. Um, and honestly, that's something that maybe when you get that instrument training and you're a little bit more comfortable with this stuff, you could think about learning how to do that. But for now, we're not going to go there, right? Okay. So here, let's say that needle is pretty far out. Instead of going east, we're going to go to the right of east. So maybe I turn to a heading of... 120. I, you know, I maxed this thing out. So I'm going to fly, 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 fly. And then when I get closer, the needle's going to start to come in. And then I'm going to want to turn back toward my east as the needle starts to center. And if there's no wind, which never happens, I'll be flying right down my line. It's that easy, right? So when the needle centers, heading equals the OBS. And you want to lead that turn, right? You don't just want to like, bam! You know, oh, the needle center. Let me go from 120 degrees to 90 degrees. Make that drastic turn. And you'll see if you fly a couple of patterns or loops around a VOR, and if you do a couple of exercises with your instructor, you're going to see right away why you don't want to have a huge intercept. Even if you're far away, you know, 60 degrees, that's a pretty hefty intercept. 30 is, is still a lot. If you're close, if you're saying like, I'm gonna get there right away, and then boom, you're gonna fly right through it and you're gonna be chasing this forever and ever and ever. So that's how you fly a radial. Now, what if there's wind? If there's wind, then you just adjust. Let's say that the wind today was coming from the north. So what's going to happen in that case is I'm going to fly, I'm going to turn on course, and then I'm going to start drifting. I'm going to drift down. How do I fix that? I turn to the left, right? The needle's going to start to deviate to the right. I'm sorry, it's going to start DB to the left. And I'm going to turn. I'm going to turn how much? Well, if I have wind, I can do what we call bracketing. Right? I want to stop the needle and then correct. So I might try by turning left 10 degrees. I might say I'm going to have a heading of 080. Can I stop the needle? 
Yes, that stopped the needle. All right, I'm going to turn a little bit more, maybe to 070, recenter the needle, and then turn back to 080. And that will allow me to get there. If I turn 10 degrees and it wasn't enough, it didn't stop the needle, then I'm going to turn 20 degrees and stop the needle. Stop the needle, turn a little bit more, get it centered, turn back to whatever stopped the needle. Right. VFR pilots, don't be super, super worried about, you know, am I going to be able to do this? Um, you probably won't spend any time flying on radials, to be honest with you, as a VFR pilot. When you get into your instrument training, yes, you might do a little bit more of this. You're going to do a lot more with it there. So that's flying a radial. What if I want to fly to a VOR? This is very easy. Tune it, identify it. It's always the first two steps. Turn OBS to the needle centers. indication fly whatever that heading is if the needle moves what do you do you keep turning the OBS You might say, well, isn't this kind of like cheating? Well, maybe. This is what we call homing. So here's what's going on. Let's say, here's my station. And I'm directly south of it. Turn my needle. And it centers with a two heading at north. I'm flying along here, but I have a wind. So there's the straight path where I adjust for the wind, kind of like what I just talked about with the first thing, flying a specific radial. And I can find a crab angle, if you will, or I can go straight down this line. Or we can do what we just talked about, where you fly, you get blown, and so you recenter the, need the needle, and now you're flying more like this. And you're coming in along this sort of a path. For a short distance, the difference between that and the straight line path is super negligible. So don't kill yourself trying to fly this path if you just need to get to that VOR. Some of the bigger airports have a VOR on the field. This will get you to the airport. Super easy to do. Right? If you have resorted to VOR navigation, you're a VFR pilot, you resorted to this to find something, you're probably having a bad day. Right? 
Don't make it worse. Don't go, I think I remember how to do that wind correction and all this other stuff. Just, just fly to that VOR. Keep it simple. All right, last thing you can do with the VOR is find where you are. And this is especially good if there are two VORs nearby and hopefully they're not along your path. This is something that I like to do if I'm planning a cross country. I wanna have a double check for my checkpoints. I wanna be able to say, how do I know that's the right town or the right tower or the right road? Well, if there's a VOR, hopefully to the side of me, I can double check my position. And it's even better if there's a couple of them. So let's say, you know, here is, oh, maybe the Milton VOR. And over here is Sealand Grove. And I want to find my position. I'm somewhat lost. And I'm just kind of flying this way. I'm not going to use that marker. So I'm flying this way. And I'm like, oh, where am I at? How do I find my position? Well, I'm going to tune. I'm going to ID VOR. Let's say I'll start with seal and scroll. What am I going to do next? I'm going to turn the OBS till needle centers. With a from indication. So let's say the needle on seal and scrub centers. This looks like yeah, maybe a 45 degree radial or so. I do the same thing with the Milton if if I have another VOR nearby. And this one centers with a uh, maybe a 260 radial. If I have a paper chart, this is extra easy. Right? Of course, if I didn't have a paper chart, I had an electronic flight bag, probably have a GPS. And this becomes an academic exercise. But I say, where do those two lines cross? It's a nice double check. And I know, yes, a lot of people have GPS today, but not everybody has it, and it doesn't always work. So you should know where you are all the time. You should know where you are. You should also be doing things like looking at places you might land if you have a problem right now. Okay, so that's the third thing you can do with a VR. So what can you do? You can fly a radio, you can fly to it, and you can find your position using it. Beyond that, for VFR pilots, you know, that's probably good enough. That's probably enough to know. Real quick, I wanted to say a little bit about this thing called an HSI, a horizontal situation indicator. Probably not gonna have this in your airplane unless you fly in a glass cockpit plane, and then you will. Uh, I say probably you won't have it. Uh, I've flown planes with this before a lot, but most training aircraft don't have this. So what is it? Basically, it's two instruments in one. This is that CDI we just talked about combined with the directional gyro. So you can think of it as a CDI that's inside of a DG. And the other nice thing about this DG is normally you never have to set it because it's slaved to the compass. So it gives you one place to look to see which way you're pointing and 
what your course is doing. Are you off course or not? The reason I wanted to bring it up is on your FAA knowledge test, you might have questions where they'll give you an HSI and they say, where's this person? You know, I have this with a from indication. So this person is pointed to the north. They've dialed in, we'll just say this is uh, 30 degrees. See, if you draw the picture, always draw a picture. If you're doing physics, that is. So they dialed in 30 and they told the radio, I want to be on this line. Headed this general direction. But I need to correct to the left. Right, the line is to my left. So it's telling me I am somewhere over here, heading to the north, but it's also telling me that I have a from indication. So I'm somewhere in this quadrant and I'm headed to the north. So I am somewhere over here. So they'll show you a bunch of airplanes and they'll say, which airplane is it? You know, maybe there's one that's pointed this way or one that's pointed some other way. So that's why I wanted to bring that up. You might have some questions on your knowledge exam where they give you an HSI as an example. All right, let's talk about the navigation system you're probably going to use most of the time. That's GPS, Global Positioning System. So how does this work? We have 24 satellites that are orbiting around the Earth, and they send you the time. You're like, what? They all have very accurate atomic clocks and they'll send you the time. So what happens is when your aircraft receives the signal from a few of these, it says, hey, this one was delayed a little bit, that one um, was a little bit earlier, and it calculates the distance from a few of these satellites. So, you know, here's the Earth, Here's these satellites, and this is going to be a very bad drawing, so I'll warn you already. You know, even looks more like TIE fighters than Rod's drawings. So, maybe I can make it a little bigger, though. So there's a satellite up here. Satellite over here. And a satellite over here. All right. So let's say, I, for sake of argument, I have three satellites. They all send my aircraft the time. Based on the delay, I can find the distance from me to the first one, me to the second one, me to the third one. Now, if I know where these are supposed to be, I can figure out my position and that that's how it works. So the computer inside the GPS does some math and it says, hey, here's the time to go to this satellite, time for the second satellite. 
time to get the, reset, the signal from the third satellite. By the way, this is why you always have an accurate clock if you have GPS. It's, you know, one of the screens you can probably see on that clock is it'll say, hey, here's the current time, just in case you were wondering. So that is basically how it works. It kind of triangulates knowing the distance from each of these and knowing where they are. So I've drawn like little lines here, but what really happens if you think about it is there's going to be a sphere around each satellite and those spheres all intercept and when they intercept that's your position now a couple of things the more satellites you have the more accurate this position is going to be number one number two the altitude is not nearly as accurate as the lateral navigation and you might say well why is that well if you look at where these satellites are you know here's the earth which is going to look flat from a high enough altitude here's you and your little aircraft little flying saucer these things are way up here So if you look laterally, it's going to be easy to tell where you are, but you know, they're looking practically on top of you, right? They're all looking down from very high altitudes on top of you. So it's going to be hard to see the exact altitude. That's one thing you should realize. Now, in order to have better accuracy, they have something called was what does was do the wide area augmentation system they have some receivers some gps receivers that are well surveyed points they know exactly where that thing is and it receives signals from the gps satellites and it says well this is where the gps says i am but it's a little bit off so WAS will send a correction signal, which if you have the correct GPS receiver, it can also receive these WAS corrections. And you can get an even more accurate position. In particular, this tends to make your altitude more accurate. You know, if you're driving your car, you're taking a walk, you don't care about the accuracy of the altitude. If you're using GPS to navigate your aircraft, you might care about that. Other things you should know, the altitude that is used for the GPS is not the same as MSL. They actually use a model of the Earth being a nice perfect sphere. So just FYI, these altitudes, you might look at your GPS altitude and go, hey, why doesn't it match up to the altitude I see on my altimeter, a couple reasons. Number one, because it's hard to have good accuracy unless you have WAS on the altitude. And number two, even if you do have WAS, it's still not going to be exactly what you want. Right? Okay. Other things to know about GPS. Same CDI is used. So I've got the CDI. And I've got my OBS still. Now my deviations are linear. It's linear deviations that it's giving me. It's not angular. So what does that mean? That means as I get closer and closer to my destination, this wouldn't naturally get more sensitive. 
So what you'll find in most GPSs, so the GPS sensitivity is linear and it's going to increase as you get close. So if you look at a typical GPS, it's going to have different sensitivities. And it might say in route or ENR. And then it might have term or terminal sensitivity. Now, when you get to using a GPS for doing instrument approaches later, you'll also see things like APR for approach sensitivity that's even more sensitive. And then if you have a WAS enabled GPS, this might be further broken down. And I'm not going to get into that today because we're still VFR here. All right, so what's the advantage? of GPS, huge advantages. GPS, for one thing, whatever you set the CDI to, doesn't matter. If you're flying a Garmin GPS and you've set it to the wrong thing, it'll eventually come up with a message. And it'll say, hey, set this to whatever. Other things to know about GPS navigation. Typically, you're going to have a database with all the local airports and nav aids. Uh, you probably have a moving map in most of these. It's probably going to be a color moving map. It might even look a lot like a sectional chart, and it really depends on the exact GPS that you have. But, you know, GPS is a beautiful thing. When I was learning to fly, we didn't have GPS. I had instructors that told me, hey, if you get lost, fly low and read the water tower. Okay, I guess, I guess you could do that. Um, a lot of things are also present in some of these GPSs, like the Garmin's, you can get a GPS Navcom, so it's got everything you need in one unit might also integrate to your transponder, and it might integrate with ADSB in and out. So you can get traffic on some of these GPS units as well. In fact, some of them will give you warnings. If someone gets close to you and they see them using your ADSB in capabilities, it'll say traffic, you know, two o'clock, less than one mile, same altitude. And that tells you, hey, I, sh I should worry about that. Uh, if you're coming up on some terrain, it'll say terrain this far ahead of you. It's telling you, hey, you should probably climb. So they are extremely useful tools. All right, and that is pretty much chapter 11. Now, Rod, in some of the post-flight briefings does talk about things like ADS, automatic direction finders. These are things that we actually have one in our training aircraft in the club here. I have never switched it on. It might work. Uh, there is not a single operational non-directional beacon in the state of Pennsylvania, to my knowledge, other than just commercial radio stations. So yeah, there's there's not a lot you can do with something like that, unless you want to listen, listen to AM radio. Uh, I suppose you could do that. So not a lot of people are using that anymore, and I think they've started to take those questions off of the knowledge test as well. He also talks about VOR testing and how you can do that. That's something you're going to learn a little bit more about when you get into IFR stuff. But that's a little bit down the road. So that is pretty much chapter 11 on radio navigation.